Uh, on to Roshanara, please. Good afternoon. Hi, Caroline. Um, I'm going to start off with some questions around concerns uh, raised by whistleblowers and then go on to the impact of COVID on your work. Um, in December 2019, an anonymous senior uh, FOS staff member alleged that that a disastrous management and reorganisation uh, uh, in, in which the call centre and specialist adjudicators were replaced with generalist investigators has left the service in disarray, uh, with the public waiting as long as two years to get justice. Um, can you talk us through what you've done since then to improve management practices and case resolution rates? Um, I mean, I think that I wouldn't necessarily um, recognise or and certainly wouldn't agree with a number of those assertions. Um, I mean, I think that the article you refer to, as I recall, refers back to um, changes that were initiated, I think actually agreed in 2015 and introduced in 2016. Um, those are matters that um, uh, you will recall, of course, most of the rest of the committee won't, that we had quite extensive engagement with the committee around in, in previous sessions, but obviously still important uh, to, to recap. I mean, we obviously in 2018 had an independent review conducted by Richard Lloyd. Um, mm -hmm. Richard Lloyd uh, did a very extensive review of the service and, and overall found it to be effective and essential. Um, picking up some of the specifics, I mean, one of the things that he did advocate, uh, he did recommend was that we should take a fresh look at case resolutions. And I think he said set, set, set realistic goals, which is obviously something we always seek to do. Um, and we did a piece of work, I think it was early 2019, where we looked across our casework and the sorts of issues we were dealing with. And we, um, we looked at what we thought was an appropriate um, objective in terms of case resolutions and, 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 and set some objectives based on that. But of course, that's only part of the objectives that we set our investigators. And so, um, you know, I think it's really important to say that we have a balanced set of measures that we set people and, and it can be easy to just focus in on um, individual case resolutions, but I think we're quite wrong. It would lead to all sorts of the wrong incentives if we were just focused on, on that number. Um, I mean, I think. Can, yeah. I, can I just? Can I just? Yeah. Um, can I just? Um, just follow up on that. The yeah. just again. I'm I'm focusing my questions on whistleblowers for the time being, oh. uh, and you'll have the opportunity to talk through more about the change and the improvements you made. You've already referred to some. Uh, the 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 whistleblower alleged that the changes meant that only 1.7 cases per week were resolved, rather than 4.5 and each case resolution now exceeds £1,100. Um, so so um, who's, who's ultimately responsible for the case resolution rate? And does this increase in cost put the financial stability of FOS uh, in doubt, uh, given, given the case fee of 650 Or is this all completely, you know, is this, is this, are these claims that you completely dispute? Let me try and explain. I think um, so. There's a number of things being kind of uh, referred to there. I mean, I think that, um, as I mentioned, so so I think sort of reference to 4.5 is a is a quite historical reference to um, you know a, a kind of uh, what we might have been thinking about back in 2015, based on whatever caseload we were anticipating. That's obviously five years ago. Um, and subsequently, we have, and we, as, as we do all the time and every year, and as, but as part of the Lloyd recommendations, we specifically looked at what is a plausible kind okay. of objective to set individuals. And we did some work looking both at what people we were achieving and also at the sort of workload that we anticipated. And off the back of that, our kind of standard expectation would be more around three to three and a half cases a week. Um, and how, how is that? How is that coming along? Is, is so, that they meeting that? Yeah, so I was going to come on to that. I mean, that would be, though, based on um, the other bit that I think is uh, somewhere in the sort of um, yeah. depth of that as well is, is the balance of the caseload. So mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to explain this in a sort of without too much, uh, yeah, without sort of talking too long, but we have a, we have a sort of um, a model that, that has a sort of broadly 70-30 approach in terms of uh, the casework. So 70% of what we do is um, such that all of our investigators should be able to deal with it. 
and then 30 percent is stuff that requires um, more of a sort of specialist depth of knowledge all of our investigators have a 30 yeah, yeah. and they have a different 30 and in steady state mm -hmm. we would hope that all investigators would, would have a caseload that was broadly 70 30 or even edging towards 80 20 but at the moment we have spikes in certain areas that mean that some of our investigators would be dealing with um, you know, much higher proportion of, of a 30. So, for example, our pensions teams, it's probably more the other way around at the moment. So they probably be more like 70% right. pensions and 30%. Yep. So, so our targets are in, on this one measure. And I should emphasize yep. just one measure in an overall basket. I'll yep. certainly flex them. So you start with the core of expectation and then you say, you yep. know, but yep. what's realistic based on your caseload? Yep. And that will, yep. that will vary. And That's in some of our higher volume cases it would be mm. it'll be higher so you yeah. know the kind of reflection of the workload that people have got so yeah, yeah no that that makes sense would it be it, i think it would be i completely understand that if you know if you're dealing with complex cases it's quite right that it's gonna you know the average um is gonna be it's, it's gonna be different um would it would you be able to give us a bit more granularity granularity excuse me in writing around some of the the different sort of types of cases um because as you say that there'll be some areas where um it's much higher uh, the number of cases um, people are uh, teams are able to resolve. I, I think that would be really helpful in terms of assuring us that things have genuinely moved on since that period, which which I appreciate was a tricky period. Just one last um, question on this segment. Um, the the and again, um, please by all means dispute if these assertions are are not ones you you agree to. But the evidence given at the March twenty eighteen employment tribunal case acknowledged that the reorganisation was a mistake. Um, uh, and uh, our, so our, our um, uh, of course, lots of things have changed in that in in the subsequent years. But our former specialist adjudicators is still working on the the so called transition pods. Not if I understand. No, just no. To fully understand if you could explain that to us. Um, yes. So again, going back in time a little bit, I think. Um, yeah. So um, so we we commenced a reorganisation back in twenty fifteen. We created new roles of investigators, um, and that was quite different in a range of ways, including going back to something we were talking about earlier in the session, in that um, we placed ever yet more emphasis on the importance of empathy and the listening skills. And I mean, those have always been important, but that's something we've, we've continued to place further emphasis on. So um, we created those roles. We set out clear expectation that those were the roles for the future. Um, yep. And over time, we've been doing it on a phase basis. We've moved to those being the predominant roles. Um, we no longer have adjudicators in our transition area, but we do still have adjudicators in what we refer to as our mass claims area, um, which is effectively payment protection insurance and a couple of other things at the moment. Um, so yep. we do still have that role. It does still exist, but um, we don't have adjudicators in, in no. that area anymore. And, and how do you, 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 you are in, an, you're in a borough that's very diverse. Um, how did this transition period affect the way you treat your staff and the way the organisation has managed diversity and change uh, and so on? Because of course, whenever there are structural changes, it can affect women and minorities and those at the bottom of the organisation. Those who hold power tend to do better. And we've seen that during the COVID crisis in the way that the NHS uh, has had many, you know, lots of challenges, for instance, in terms of those who particularly, um, you know, uh, suffered. Uh, how do you how do you handle change, and how did you what what are the lessons from the change management process that the organisation you feel has done well in, in terms of managing all of that, in terms of the people who work in your organisation yeah. and yeah. how they are treated, as well as what lessons can be learned from that experience? Because let's be frank, um, it wasn't. It wasn't all entirely pretty. I mean, you were the subject of a panorama investigation as well. It seems like splitting hairs to say dispatches, but um, yes, yeah. it was a very difficult period. It's certainly true to say. Um, I mean, I, I think you know, it was incredibly challenging. Um, I think, though, that we made some very important changes that were the right ones to move the organisation forward, but that in no way detracts from the fact that it was very difficult and particularly difficult for our people. 
And I and we learned a lot from that. I mean, I think certainly in approaching the Lloyd Review, which was obviously looking at the allegations that were made, and I think which um, you know were, were not found to be um, fair accusations in the main. I mean, I think that in doing that and listening to that report, we tried, and I tried very much not to sort of, you know, it's easy, isn't it, when you're being criticised to just sort of hunker down and defend. And we tried to, to not do that and yep. quite deliberately said, no, we're going to we're going to open up and we're going to listen and we're going to learn and we're going to get better. And I think that's what we have done. Um, one of the big things, and it's, you know, everyone says it, but, you know, having lived it, it's so, so true, is internal communication. You can yeah. never communicate enough. Um, you know, all of those experts in change management that tell you that, they're a bit right. Um, and we have really uh, improved our internal communication function. And I think that's been, been a big feature. Um, and we've been actually, you know, it's, it's ongoing change, you know, we're still in the midst, it's not like any organisation, it's not like, okay, good, done, change, move on, we are constantly changing, and I think one of the things we've really tried to do is to make sure that our people are much more part of that, and that we are hearing their voices, um, and our you, you... levels have really improved, I think. Uh, and if you could, it would be really helpful. I mean, it may already be out in the public domain, but it would be helpful to get some breakdown of numbers in terms of what the organisation now looks like uh, in terms of um, in terms of the makeup of, of your teams and, and so on. Uh, oh. it, maybe another another thing to follow up on, if you can. Yeah, by all means. Um, I mean, that's mostly published, but very happy to, to, to draw that to your attention. Yeah. It, it, Brilliant, thank you. I'm just gonna I'm gonna move on to the impact of COVID. Um, so so obviously you've had you've had all of the stuff to do deal with in terms of PPI and reorganisation. No, I don't think anyone envies you. And and of course it goes without saying that that Foz has done it deals with you pointed out a lot of complaints and and you know of course we hear about the negatives, but credit where it's due, where you've resolved a lot of people's concerns uh, and problems. Um, we then face COVID. We haven't seen you, um, obviously, uh, in, in recent months. What impact has COVID-19 had on the ability of FOS to undertake the core mandate, um, which is to investigate and decide consumer and small business complaints against uh, financial services for firms? Uh, and if you could then reflect on how you've addressed it. I mean, in your website, you've talked about not being able to get back to people, you know, uh, for, for many weeks. Um, could you talk us through how all of this has impacted your ability to deliver the core mandate? Sure, yeah, I mean, and I think kind of starting from the immediate response perhaps, and I can sort of lead into um, the, yeah. where we are now. I mean, I think, um, Obviously, like uh, like everyone else, really, we we needed to go from being you know, we had a bit of home working, but largely an office based operation, to being um, you know pretty much almost entirely home based and pretty much overnight. Um, and I'm enormously proud of the way in which our people have been able to do that. I think we responded very well and, and very quickly. Um, so, some of our ombudsman colleagues, I think, in other sectors have needed to effectively close the doors for a period and not take any new cases. We, we didn't do that. We haven't needed to do that. Um, we face some you know, practical challenges, like, you know, actually, the one thing you can't do remotely, uh, completely remotely, is the physical post. So um, we did have, um, after a short hiatus, we had a number of colleagues going in every week to scan the physical post in so that we can then process it. So, um, you know, it's just re very real and needs your practical challenges. We, um, it took the phone lines, I think we had to close for, you know, like a day or so, but we then very quickly got that back up and running. So we've been able to operate, you know, inevitably there's an impact, but we've been able to operate our service effectively, I think, throughout lockdown. So, so, so you've, I mean, you've received more complaints. You've had three and a half thousand yeah. complaints to deal with. So obviously that's huge pressure on the team. Um, so, so how has it impacted on the length of time within which you're able to resolve complaints? Yeah, I mean, so we were making uh, some very good progress in reducing wait times that will come under further pressure. I mean, we, over the summer and over the last few months, have seen a really significant increase in terms of new complaints. Um, mm -hmm. And we've published some information today, actually setting out some of that. Um, I think the other very important impact I should mention is that for a time, financial businesses actually had to 
in some cases actually suspend their complaint handling and so that had a material impact on their ability right. to respond to us as well right. so um across i mean particularly in ppi but actually in other areas as well as they would, it, would insurance what's happened in the insurance sector because if uh, is it a quarter of your complaints are from them does it, does it suggest yeah. that they've basically been uh, uh not treating their customers fairly during this period well, there's been a lot of activity, I think it'd be fair to say. I mean, I think travel insurance is one of the areas that, that has really gone up and um, other event assurance as well um, is the other thing that, that's notable. Um, and business interruption insurance, which is another area that I'm sure the committee will be familiar yeah. with. Um, yeah. I mean, I think in terms of outcomes, some of those obviously are still being investigated so um so time will tell i mean i think my sense for it is that as ever it's a bit of a mixed bag there are some cases where we need to explain to customers why unfortunately they don't have cover in the circumstances um we have seen so how, long, how long how long on average are you seeing um the length of complaints you know but, but in specific terms um the time it takes to deal with complaints now how, i mean you've already had a lot to deal with then you've overlay a COVID on top of that with thousands more complaints uh, for the points you're raising in terms yep. of why that's happening. Uh, how does that affect your overall ability to, to deliver your mandate and try and deal with complaints? Um, and what can you do to, you know, in a timely manner? What can you do? What support do you need to try and address that? Yeah, I mean, I think a big part of the answer to that question is our preparation and plan for the next year as well, which we are in the midst of um, a drawing together and we'll be beginning consultation. I mean, we we have been recruiting quite extensively. We were, after again a brief pause, we have been able to recruit throughout um, the lockdown and an ongoing period of home working. And we'll, by the end of the year, we'll have added about another 400 um, investigators into the service, which is by no means trivial. Um, we are also looking at the kind of nature of the complaints we're seeing and looking at where there are opportunities to resolve them, you know, as a group or in different ways. But I think the other important part of my answer has to be where we began with the chair's questions, which is prevention. And I think there are some specific areas where we would be uh, very much looking to work, obviously, in partnership with the FCA and also with the industry itself to try and prevent those future complaints. And that's a big part of the answer because actually it's obviously yeah. it's doing the cases we've got but it's also preventing do you, think, do you feel do you feel you're being assertive enough in telling the other agencies what they need to do as well as uh, the government departments where they they can play a role to do that prevention or are you are you constantly because because i think you know you may you may think this may be an unfair caricature but it has come across like you've been dumped on over recent years, whether it's PPI or SME, you know, G GRG, the post GRG fallout and what, you know, you've been expected to deliver on the complaints um, without without adequate resource and backing. Um, should Are you being, have you got a big enough voice in, in the kind of, in, in terms of the community of organizations to deal with the prevention? And if not, what do you need? Um, to, to get that message across. And the, my final point is, is related to business interruption loan and so on. How do you see that as being different from what you've been dealing with uh, in the past? And should we be concerned about um, how this pandemic exposes SMEs, um, uh, you know, exposes consumers or SMEs in terms of, in terms of uh, you know, I suppose, where are the kind of, where are the big emerging challenges vis-a-vis -vis this pandemic um, as we saw in, you know, belatedly after the financial crisis and the GRG scandal and the impact on SMEs? Uh, yeah, I mean, going, going back to the beginning of your question, I mean, I think, I think yes. I think um, the, the, the question that underpins that, I think, in a sense, is what is the proper policy response when there is a um, complaint or, let's say, actually, rather more broadly, a, a, an issue of detriment that affects a large number of people? And so I think the, the question that I have asked and continue to ask in, in uh, different situations is, um, is a complaint-led response the right one? Now, PPI is obviously the biggest example of that, um, but, but, but there are others. And I, and I think for me, that's one area that I, I, I do think, and we are discussing that with the FCA. I think, you know, there is a question in my mind about when a complaints-led approach is the right one and when it isn't. And, um, you know, the FSA in, in its day decided on a complaints-led process against the advice that we gave at the time, I think, um, to consider alternatives. 
Um, and, you know, the, the rest, as they say, is history. Um, you know, two, two million cases and counting. Um, and, and I have to hope we'd all take some lessons from that. Um, I mean, actually, business interruption insurance, I think, is an example where the FCA has stepped in and, and sought an alternative approach, because had they not um, instituted the test case approach, then the natural order of things would have been that that would have just resulted in very large number of complaints to the Ombudsman Service or to the courts, um, which would have been perhaps even more disorderly in a way. Um, so, you know, very much welcome the steps that the FCA took there, which ought to lead to redress for people on a, on a bigger scale without the need to complain. So there's, a, there's a, obviously a, a theme there. Um, so, I mean, business interruption insurance, notwithstanding that, we do still have um, some complaints. Um, that we, I think we've got about a thousand, just over a thousand complaints at the moment. Um, some of which were able to progress, but most of which are impacted by the test case, um, which we all need to um, await the outcome. Um, we have also seen complaints around the um, government-backed schemes, loan schemes, albeit um, in relatively small number relative to the you know, number of loans that have been advanced. And I think where we've been able to play an important, really important role there has been in stepping in early and trying to and getting people actually the outcome before it becomes a long blown thing. So, um, you know, we've we've got quite a number of instances. I had a very nice thank you in my inbox the other day from a small business owner where um, he was just struggling to access the funds. There was a bit of a hold up. There was a bit of an issue. We stepped in. We spoke to the business. The business looked at it, got the uh, got this situation ironed out, and, and got his funds to him. And so, um, we always envisaged when we took on the SME jurisdiction that, as well as some of the more complex, um, you know, detailed decisions we'd need to take, it would also very much be about trying to facilitate early resolution. And, and I'm pleased to say that is something that we've been able to do. Thank you. Thank you very much.